birthday or something. Yeah, they were saying that. Right. Hello and welcome into this program, Top Shot, the program in which we talk to personalities to talk about issues that concern you and me. And always we are always encouraged by what we hear in this program. So today I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Montesquieu Alualia with us. Dr. Montesquieu Alualia, welcome to this program. Thank you. And in fact, what we are going to do now is talk about various issues. And you are sitting in a very important position, a Deputy Chairman Planning Commission, an institution which was created many years ago at a time when we are doing centralized planning. And at a time when we thought for some time that market is going to solve all our problems, and now again the markets are collapsing, and therefore in that context we are really looking forward to you to seek solution to the problems that we are facing today. So welcome to this program, and we'll be talking on many issues, and I'm sure you'll we'll provide answers to many of the questions that the viewers have in their mind. So first of all, what do you think? Uh, what do you make of this crisis? Because uh, everybody seems to be concerned, and what is more concern is we don't know what's going to happen next. We never thought that the largest economy like U.S. will ever have these problems, and now because U.S. is facing these problems, the rest of the world is also facing the problem. So, what do you make of this crisis that is really engulfing us? Well, it's, it's, there's no doubt that it's a very major crisis, and many people have said that you know, it was the worst crisis since the Great Depression. And if you look back in the history of development, you do get periodic crises. They result because of weaknesses in one side of the system or the other. And then, of course, the system heals itself. Now, in this particular case, I think the crisis really originated in many things. I mean, there was a macroeconomic imbalance, and the United States was living beyond its means. You know, very high current account deficit, and on the other hand, there were other countries running large current account surpluses. Uh, this was facilitated by a very high liquidity regime with low interest rates, that in turn led to uh, the development of a particular kind of financial system, uh, which led to excessive borrowing, excessive leverage, interest rates were low, liquidity was uh, very high, and created a lot of what at that time was called financial innovation, new kinds of instruments, ways of making people borrow who really shouldn't be borrowing at all. The derivatives. Uh, derivatives of one kind or the other, securitization of loans and so forth. You know, all of this was what was supporting uh, living beyond uh, their means. I mean, that's a, that's a core uh, rock bottom thing. And I think that system uh, basically collapsed as very often a house of cards uh, will collapse. Uh, and I think this showed uh, financial fragility. Uh, now, you can call that a regulatory failure in the sense that the financial regulatory system should have spotted it and should have taken corrective steps. You can also call this a policy coordination failure. You know, because for the, for the last three years or four years, it's been known that the United States is running a huge deficit. Yeah. And what is, in a way, one of the richest countries in the world, instead of providing capital to the rest of the world, is absorbing well, capital. So... Problems at different, uh, coming out of different sources leading to a big issue. Now, I think the point is the U.S. being the world's largest economy, when it has a problem, it's not just a U.S. problem, it spills over. Uh, and I think we've seen that. At the start of the crisis, 
European countries thought this is just an American problem, but very quickly it was clear that they also suffered from similar problems on the financial side. And now the rest of the world is feeling the ripple effects. We are also. So I think this shows that, you know, uh, it's a m major problem which has occurred in a world that is globalized. Its first transmission is through the world of finance, but that will also impact on the real economy mm -hmm. because the U.S. will certainly not uh, grow as rapidly as it did in the last two or three years. So the U.S. slows down. Everybody's exports will slow down. And I think uncertainty is leading to temporarily a uh, negative effect on investment. So, so money is going away from the rest of the world into the United States. So from Wall Street to the Main Street and from Main Street to the gullies of India. Yes, I think. So violence of India in probably. Yes. <laughs> probably. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, we, uh, we do not have uh, the same kind of problems that the U.S. does. I think mean, our financial system is not exposed to the sorts of problem assets in all these securitized loans, uh, derivative instruments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the exposure to those in the foreign branches of our banks is absolutely minimal. So the direct impact of the financial crisis on our banking system is very small. You know, but when there was a crisis elsewhere, and you know, well-known international banks, you read in the newspapers, they are not trusting each other, banking has come to an end. It caused a bit of a scare in India, and I think the government took very prompt action, assured everybody that liquidity will be provided. And I think that is now clear. I mean, people know that Indian banks are functioning and there's no problem there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have second round effects because two or three things have happened. I mean, one is that external uh, sources of credit, which our companies were beginning to access, like borrowing abroad, these have dried up. So these companies which were borrowing abroad quite successfully now have to raise all those resources Domestic. at home. So there's a shortage of liquidity, even though bank credit is not small. What is happening is other credit has d dried up. So to some extent, the banks have to do more in order to make up for this loss of credit. And then there is the decline that will occur in exports yeah. for all countries and also for us. Yeah. That will that'll lead to a slowing Domestic down. demand there goes down. That means yes. our exports, so will, our be exports will be somewhat. Now, much less than many other countries. Yeah. Because, you know, our exposure uh, to, I mean, our dependence yeah. on global markets is still much less than other countries, yeah. although that it's more than it was earlier. Yeah. The third uh, transmission signal is investment. Yeah. You know, we are were viewed and will, I think, in the longer term still be viewed as a very attractive investment destination because we are a faster growing country with the potential to grow fast. But you know, in a period when the financial world for these major foreign investors is going through so much difficulty, one would expect that foreign direct investment plans mm -hmm. will be a little bit more uncertain. Yeah. And that impacts on expectations everywhere. So I think there'll be some negative effect. And the FDI there means that domestic savings are not sufficient enough to invest outside. They will not try to put it out. Yes. But you know, just tell me, you mentioned that this essentially is a crisis emanating not from India, but from US, also partly from Europe and other places. Mm -hmm. But all the time, India was trying to integrate into the global market. Mm -hmm. Now, we are today saying that we are not that badly affected because we are not that much integrated into global market. Mm -hmm. So, suppose if you had succeeded in our mission of integrating fully into the global market, mm -hmm. would you think at hindsight it looks like a mistake you would have committed? No, I don't think so. You know, I think what the, in, uh, the effort to integrate into the global market is not just financial. Actually, on the financial side, we were always of the view that w until we become a much stronger economy, we cannot take easily a rapid in and out movement of foreign capital. But integrating on the real side, exports, imports, lowering tariffs, this we were ready for and we have done and we've done quite well. Now, what the globalization did is what you saw in the last four years. That is to say, uh, the GDP growth was close to 9%. Now, you know, we have never had 9% growth for four years in a row ever before. Okay. What has now happened is you've seen an interruption from the rest of the world. This year, the GDP growth will be definitely much below 9%. I think the Reserve Bank just last week uh, gave an estimate of 75 to 8 And the Prime Minister a few Worst days ago in so Parliament said, you know, the lowest estimate 7%. is 7%. So let us, let us suppose it's 7%. 
basically we are going down from 9 to 7. That's a 2 percentage point mm -hmm. decline. But I think what integration has done is it made it possible to grow at 9. And what interconnectedness has done is it has brought it down to 7. Now, if you go to the previous four years, the growth rate was a little over 6 percent. And if you go to the 1990s, it was 5.6 percent. So I feel that the globalization is not globalizing is not the answer. But I think we must globalize carefully. And I think we have to recognize that when you globalize, there are certain risks and we better be ready for them. Fortunately, we have been reasonably well protected. One reason is that our banks are extremely well regulated. And, you know, we took a lesson from the East Asian crisis because when that happened in 1997, one of the central messages of that crisis was that East Asian banks were not well regulated. Yeah. And we did a lot of work at that time and put the banking system into a much stronger position. Yeah. And the second thing is that, you know, what globalization has done is it has opened up tremendous economic opportunities for the country. And I think our industry has shown that it is perfectly capable of integrating. And that is reflected in the higher growth, which is now interrupted. Now, I think if we manage the situation well, we should be able to get back to our high growth path. Obviously, it depends on how quickly the world recovers. M my feeling is that uh, 2008 is going to be a bad year for the world. Many people think that 2009 will also be a poor year. And the real economy, probably the financial system will stabilize by the end of this year. Yeah. Uh, and then slowly begin to 10, recover. 2010 reasonable is a year for I think 2010 is a reasonable year for getting back to normal. 2009 is a year when people might start seeing a turnaround. Now, from our point of view, if so we can... winter, and I think we'll have to wait for the spring to come maybe. Yeah, but you now. know, a winter at 7% growth is pretty good. Yeah. So, so I think we wait for the I mean spring of 3, 9%. So it is not snowing yet. It is not, it's definitely not snowing yet. Just well, a bit you, cool. You know, you mentioned uh, one of the things that we are not very badly affected. But look at our stock markets. Uh, some scripts have lost almost 85% of the value. Mm -hmm. I mean, some scripts were quoted at uh, 1,000 rupees are now available for 50 rupees and 100 rupees. Something like this, uh, is it not uh, no, the, I think the that lot of uh, people? Of course, yeah. one exp explanation is that if I have taken money away, but even the small investors have lost huge amount of money. I mean, that's uh, something that I really know, I, very adversely. I would say that's absolutely correct. And the area where we uh, the impact has been strongest uh, and also uh, the pain perhaps has been the greatest is on the stock market. Now, everybody knows that stock markets are volatile. They do well in good years and they can turn down. But, you know, when the downturn happens, many people get caught in the downturn. If these people have the staying power and they can hold on for another couple of years, then things get back to normal. But I agree with you that the decline in stock values that we have seen are very large. Similar declines have taken place virtually everywhere. Yeah. In the Chinese stock market has collapsed even more. But That's not, that doesn't ratio make it any easier. Hmm? In China, the P yeah. ratio were 40, yeah. India was about 20, yeah. 25, fortunately. Yeah. So I think that. if you actually, I did a little graph. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, Sensex and you compare the Sensex with the Dow Jones index and you go back two years and you put them at exactly the same point, then in the first year after that, uh, the Sensex did much better than the Dow. Then it began to come down. And when the Dow really collapsed, it has come down to exactly where the Dow okay. would be. So the, you know, the, the very good growth we had in the stock market so a couple of years ago. strategic relationship not between been, U.S. and India, but also between Dow Jones and BSE. Well, I'm afraid, you know, this is a short, uh, in the sense that my feeling is that uh, when the uh, faster growth of the Indian economy was evident, Okay, uh, It led to a lot of enthusiasm in people buying into the stock market. But when the global economy turned down very sharply, even though India was growing at 7%, uh, the stock market did worse yeah. than the real economy. And I think the longer term answer to that is, you know, really one has to recognize that stock markets, basically if the real economy does well, the stock markets will do well over a longer period. But in the short run, it's impossible to predict what they're going to do. But, you know, look at the stock market movement. For example, the, when the markets were really going up, we had a huge capital flows into the Indian economy, mm -hmm. coming essentially from foreign institutional investors wanting to buy portfolio 
uh, assets in India. Mm -hmm. You know, actually that excess capital that the FIs were bringing in, now it is clear that they're coming out of derivatives, they were trying to actually leverage and they're trying to bring the money in. Mm -hmm. So this was the excess liquidity which was created outside which came into the country. Mm -hmm. I always feel when normally, as a rule, you go and park your car somewhere, you pay parking charges to the municipal corporation. Mm -hmm. You go and park your ornament into the bank, mm -hmm. you pay parking charges to the bank. Here, the excess liquidity was parked here and we are euphoric that stock markets are going up, that's the strength of how Indian economy is doing well. But now it's clear that excess liquidity has gone away. The good example is ICICI, the second largest bank of India, the biggest private sector bank in the country. More than 65% of the capital was held by the FIS. When they took the money away, the bank virtually lost much of its market capitalization. Mm -hmm. So do you think now really need to regulate, along with the international regulation that should come in to regulate the banking institution, should we also bring about some sort of a regulation for capital flows, which is now impacting our domestic economy? Mm -hmm. Because when they went away, the savings of Indian uh, households have also gone away. Well, yeah, this is a bit, uh, uh, as you can see, it, it was a major shift, but I don't think that the, uh, there's been a total loss because what has happened is this. When a lot of liquidity came into the system, uh, we didn't want the rupee to appreciate, right? So the rupee was stabilized and we gained foreign exchange reserves. N then FII is left. Yes, some decline of reserves took place, but we still have $250 billion of reserves. Yeah. So actually what has happened is the, uh, the excess liquidity was a little bit sterilized in the form of foreign exchange reserves. So we've ended the period with a huge accretion of reserves. Now, the question is, what are we going to use these reserves for? Yeah. Now, if these reserves are never to be used for anything, yeah. then of course they're completely useless. Yeah. But I think we could use these reserves, uh, A, to insulate ourselves from balance of payments shocks. So, for example, normally, if exports go down, as they might, I mean, not they won't go down, but the growth rate will come down. Somebody might feel that, you know, we have a balance of payments problem. We don't need to worry about that because we've got all these foreign exchange reserves. I think we can use these reserves also to invest in things like infrastructure. Yeah. So, whereas the FIIs may not have directly invested in infrastructure. I think that was the idea of reserves. that we heard about that $5 billion of money will be yes, taken out. Yes. We'll talk about it. But tell me something, this foreign exchange reserves now. You know, the last economic survey talked about 8,200 crores as a cost of carrying these foreign exchange reserves. Now, mm -hmm. something like this, that means there's a cost attached to it. But more than that, on one hand, we have foreign exchange reserves built up. It went to almost $325 billion at the peak of best of time. But much of it is accumulated from a foreign currency loans that our Indian uh, corporates have mm -hmm. taken if, if, um, if for a if foreign currency loan, external commercial borrowing, ECBs. Mm -hmm. Number two, it is also at a time when there is a huge current account deficit. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that now our um, IT exports are $40 billion. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have got highest remittances, mm -hmm. which are coming from non residents who are sending it to India, and the India mm -hmm. is the single largest destination mm -hmm. for that. Despite that, we have got a huge current account deficit. We have got trade deficit. And we have got a huge external commercial borrowing, which is also raising our reserves. Mm -hmm. So if you think it's a worrying thing that current account deficit constantly rising, going in terms of now almost 4-5% of GDP, something like that? No, I think it won't be 4-5%. Actually, I, this is an important issue. Our trade deficit is very high. Yeah. Uh, but our services imports, yeah. I mean exports, yeah. are a very important offsetting yeah. factor. So until about a year ago, we were actually running a small current account surplus. surplus. I think last year that yeah. changed into a current deficit. account deficit. And this year the deficit will be larger. Yeah. My guess is that this year you may be running a deficit of 3% of GDP perhaps. Earlier we thought it might be 3.5%, but because with the softening of oil prices it might be 3%. Yeah. You know, 3% of the deficit, of the current account deficit is something which under normal circumstances a country like India can easily afford to run because the rest of the world should invest yeah. foreign direct investment in India of that magnitude. Now, this year, uh, that may not happen because it's a totally exceptional yeah. year. But I think looking ahead, if we were... I mean, even in the 11th plan, for example, uh, we, we planned for a current account deficit of about 2.5% of GDP. Because we said that, look, otherwise we, we don't use it and we lower our own investment level. It's perfectly reasonable to do more investment and offset that by a little bit bigger current account deficit. But you just have to keep that current account deficit within the limit which is consistent 
with long term capital flows yeah but you know for first of all do you think there is a need for moderating capital flow that could be an agenda for future but you know coming to this point of deliberately keeping current account deficit of 2.5% 3% of the gdp to incentivize investment into the country one of the other way to look at it is india has a high savings rate so you know basically we are never really encouraged the savings in the economy either household savings corporate savings or the government savings government savings of course has been negative unfortunately despite frbm for um, fiscal regulation fiscal responsibility budget management act despite that we have a deficit but what is that do you think we should try to even incentivize the domestic savings in economy like china has almost 50% of the economy which is saving so that's a very high saving rate which mm. is helping them to mm. also have a good investment ratio do you think india should actually encourage also while we get foreign investment into india we should also encourage well, domestic I, savings as a general rule we've always encouraged domestic savings and i do feel that you know a very large part even the dominant part of our investment should be financed from domestic savings but the position is this you know if if for example our domestic savings rate is about 34% okay yeah we can either keep investment at 34% yeah. or we can raise domestic saving above 34% to get to 37 yeah. 38 or we can keep it at 34 and raise the investment rate to 38 Now you know 34% a pretty high, high. rate of uh, savings and I know China invests uh, saves 50% yeah. but you know given our income levels uh, while I think our richer people should be encouraged to save more for the economy as a whole our, our consumption levels are still low I I'm not sure that I would so be wanting the next round of growth saving. you feel it should be consumption driven more than sa- domestic savings driven well no I think uh, look the object of development if you want people to perceive that development is giving some good results to them their consumption must rise i mean yeah. that's what development yeah. is about the consumption can be either your personal consumption you know whatever yeah. food and clothes and uh, articles and so on or it can be social consumption yeah. like education health all this is consumption these things have to increase but the point is that Which we should still have impact save. on human developing that is also yes absolutely so you also feel but that. i would say that i i would say roughly that uh, if as long as we grow rapidly we are say b- anything between 7 and 9% <coughs> we will do not worse than 7 we hope to do 9 next year for that kind of growth having a current account deficit of 3 to 3.5% of gdp providing it is fed largely by foreign direct investment not by borrowing is i think is a good idea not by well, some borrowing is also possible you know after all our borrowing today is not that high and as our economy grows the ratio of borrowing to economy can remain constant so as long as the short term borrowings are not more in terms yes of that is an important but see even there i think one of the big advantages that uh, this build up of reserves has done is that we can afford short term borrowing because yeah. actually what is happening is instead of using our reserves we may do some short term borrowing so we so just possible you have some uh, leeway there there's a lot of leeway and elbow room available yes. so we'll come back to you again and we'll talk about it we're talking to dr monte singh aluwalia the deputy chairman planning commission about the state of economy and what should india be doing in this crisis situation to make sure that india continues to grow at 9% or more than that to ensure that india really becomes a power that we are all hoping for so don't go away we'll come back soon and continue talking to dr monte singh aluwalia i'm this suresh prabhu waiting for you to come back So welcome back to Top Shot the program in which we are talking to Dr Montek Singh Aluwalia Deputy Chairman Planning Commission on many issues related to Indian economy planning and growth So Dr Aluwalia you are saying that uh, this growth will be there 7% definitely will be there maybe we'll again go back to 9% figure which we achieved in the last few years but you said India will not be affected much by this crisis and we always hear this talk of India having strong fundamentals now something like this you know it looks like now we talk about religious fundamentalism but this looks like a new <laughs> fundamentalism which we hear about what are these fundamentals because looking at this we have current account deficit we have got fiscal deficit we have got revenue deficit we have got trade deficit again if you compare a total debt not just uh, external debt but domestic debt external debt put together to gdp is also pretty high 
as a result of which our interest liability is pretty high, more than 50 percent of the current income. So, what is really this fundamentals really talk about? Because I have always wondered this, you know, because all these parameters seem to me a little worrying, but still we maintain that fundamentals are strong. So, what do you mean by that actually? No, you're, you're rightly saying that there are certain dimensions where our economic uh, data could be better than they are. It's certainly the fiscal side, the debt side, these are the weak spots. I don't think the current account deficit is a weak spot because I think 3, 3.5% three is okay. okay. In fact, in the last three or four years, the fact that we are a surplus, it was unnecessary. We should actually be running a deficit. Now, what are the fundamentals? Number one, high saving rate. It is very, very important that India saves 34% of uh, GDP. Uh, it means that even if we don't get foreign investment, we can have one of the highest investment rates in the developing world. And I can tell you that many other developing countries in um, Africa, in Latin America, do not have these high savings. And America is a negative rate. Ne America, of course, be negative. Mm -hmm. Now, Asian countries have had high savings rates. So this is a kind of an Asian cultural uh, characteristic, yeah. which I believe was a strength for Japan, was strength for Korea, strength for China, e East Asia, Southeast Asia, India. That's one thing. Second is the spirit of entrepreneurship and the ability of a system to produce good entrepreneurs, get out there and take risks, compete. It diversifies a lot of decision making. And I think we are blessed by the fact that our people are enterprising. Whether that means the fellow who runs a shop, whether it means the fellow who starts a tailoring establishment, somebody who starts a small business, small business becomes middle business, and also people who run very large companies and are benchmarking themselves against the best in the world. Now, this is not easy to do. I mean, there are many other countries that have our kind of per capita GDP, but nobody would say that they have a strong, capable private sector. Entrepreneurship is one thing. Uh, professional management skills is another. And I think we are very well endowed in professional management skills, engineering, law, uh, management in general, etc., etc. These are very important things. There are some weak areas. I, I wish we had a much better infrastructure. I, I think we have underinvested in infrastructure in the last 10 years. We are now correcting that. If we need to keep doing it for another 10 years in order to Minimum. put us in a position where people would not say that. But today, people coming to India who are very positive about many things about India will certainly say my infrastructure should have been better. So that's a weak spot. You know, I think in terms of soft institutions, uh, we underestimate the fact that in a world in which, you know, economics is not the only thing. Uh, the fact that we are running a democracy, it's uh, very often internally people might think that it doesn't function too well. Uh, people might, I mean, after all, we have now had a long experience of coalition governments. Many ordinary people feel that, you know, this, is, uh, this has its own problems of day-to-day -day management. But I think the rest of the world looking at India and seeing a democratic system which allows dissent, which allows differences of political opinion, sometimes even very contentious, but on the whole managing to keep it together is a very, very big strength. So all I think these, all these things together are so fundamental. Are, when you say fundamental, you are not just talking about these numbers in terms of coming from the public accounts or from this, but yeah, this is I'm going not. beyond that. Yeah, That's I'm what not. you meant. I agree. I and I think that the, on the deficit, fiscal deficit, I wish we were doing a better job. No, but you just mentioned one of the fundamentals which really keeps us going is private sector. And the private sector late growth, which we are really seen from 91, is not really public sector driven really, it's a private sector driven growth. Mm -hmm. Maybe private sector, small businesses, services or even manufacturing, but mm -hmm. this is really coming collectively from that. But you know, the government basically has to contribute to the growth in terms of not just living to the private sector because... Absolutely. You, now, if that is what if we should be doing as a government, mm -hmm. then in terms of doing business in India, India ranks one of the lowest in the world in terms of reports that are compiled by the World Bank year after year. So why is that? Because, you know, this is despite it, like telling the business that it's a hurdles race. You know, we don't win many medals in the Olympics. So we are keeping a hurdles race back home. Keep winning the race. So we'll get a gold probably medal at the end of it by getting export order from somewhere or getting an order into the domestic market. Mm -hmm. But why can we not remove these hurdles in terms of at least little thing? This is not a big reform, big ticket reform that we talk about. Doing business in India in terms of changing it, in terms of making it better. Bangladesh has a better record than India in terms of doing business. Why is that? I mean, what, what really prevents us from doing this? 
No, it's a very, very good question. I, I don't, I don't want to duck it. I mean, if you were to ask me, um, is it a genuine problem that uh, doing business in India is difficult? I think the answer is yes. Uh, a lot of these questionnaires, however, are questionnaires about perception. And I think in many areas, the reforms of the last 10 years, which have been pursued by multiple governments, it's not just one government, in many areas, things have got very much simplified. I mean, in the old days, you know, you couldn't open a factory without getting an in industrial license. You couldn't bring in technology without getting a technology license. You 